In our small house in the Mesa, I had my chores. One afternoon in early December, as the sun was sliding down towards the horizon, I was folding laundry, listening to John Cage perform Indeterminacy. His stories were varied in content, length, and delivered in that crisp, precise telling and lovely, calm voice of his. Every once in a while, some sounds, often ugly or abrasive, would occur. This irritated me, as I loved the storytelling. I was so moved, I decided to write my own stories, which I began doing while listening to his. However, as I drew deeper into the writing, I stopped hearing his stories. This bothered me. The recordings stopped. I kept writing. The sun had set with only a small patch of snow on a distant mountain, glowing pink in the last rays. I could hear my blood pulsing, or was it the frequency of my nervous system? Sitting in a doctor's waiting room, reading in Art in America an article about Glenn Ligon's retrospective at the Whitney, in which the writer says, questions about the difference between reading and looking are germane to Glenn Ligon's work. I thought then and I'm thinking now. Questions about the difference between listening and hearing are germane to this work. Questions about the difference between looking and listening are germane to this work. Questions about feeling and remembering are germane to this work. Questions about observing and understanding are germane to this work. April morning in a car headed to LaGuardia, I heard on National Public Radio an interview segment with the author of a new telling of Exodus. I listened while writing a story about a day spent with my mother Estella at the Theresienstadt concentration camp. The story I was writing spoke of her remembering a folk strategy to learn to play the guitar. While listening and writing, I began to sing under my breath John Henry a song Estella had told me she could play on the guitar once, although I never heard her do so. Don Henry said to the captain, Captain, I'm a driving man. If I don't drive that steam engine down, I'll die with a hammer in my hand, lordy, lordy. I'll die with a hammer in my hand. It was March. A light snow was falling. Uzoyuki, the Japanese call it. And though I was grateful for the heartbreaking beauty of snow on weighted bamboo, the latticework of budding trees, and the frosted granite boulders, I fell into comparing this March evening with that evening 24 years ago when it was warmer. For Scythia were in bloom everywhere as the neighborhood seemed to be holding its breath. And Arnie, was dying upstairs in the bedroom. It was Harris, Janie May, Roosevelt, Richard, whose name was sometimes Boot. It was Ira Lee and Ezel, La Siena and Rodessa. For me, means that Rodessa. would always be March. It was Violina. Our family home was an old farmhouse built in the late 19th century. Located up a hill in a valley of forest and farmland. In the summer, the shadow of clouds racing over fields of grass, wheat, alfalfa, and oats was transcendental in its beauty. However, 
when those same clouds turned steely gray, spiked with lightning, and the crack of thunder that followed was so loud, small children would whimper. We all obeyed when an adult said, set your butt down and be still. Don't you know the good Lord is working? It was the end of a hard day of reconstructing D-Man in the Water with their company at Bard College. For days, Janet Wong had patiently been redirecting the process, carefully instructing each dancer where they should be and what they should be doing. During the rehearsal, between multiple repeats of sequences, dancers crouched over a computer screen, squinting at various casts from previous incarnations of the work. Seven-year-old Mika, sitting with Kyle Maud, was also looking at a computer screen when she asked, what is the strongest muscle in the body? Children ask questions like that. After some time spent on the internet with Kyle, the answer was found, sort of. The strongest muscle in the body is either the heart or the eye. 